This is Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. Glad you could join me on this brand new edition of New Life Program and hopefully you will enjoy my company just as I hope to enjoy yours. I'm your host, Tilen Odiambo. Today, Pastor Kibundu has an ironic topic that goes by the name Humor That Hurts. I wouldn't wish to miss that and so do you. Later on in the Bible segment, the same able voice will be telling us what money should do. For those and more entertaining items, stay tuned to Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. Listener, I hope that you are still enjoying the show. Let us now listen to Pastor Kigundu with the topic, Humor That Hurts. Dear listener, we invite you again to our marriage series, The Abundant Life. And today I want us to talk about jokes and humor that hurt marriage. Have you ever been with a couple when one of them says a cutting, sarcastic remark about the other while that spouse is there and even you are embarrassed by it? 
Often these barbs are treated by the one giving them as if they are a joke, and yet the one receiving them sure isn't laughing. Many couples confess that there have been times within their own marriage that they have done that themselves. They have fallen into the type of shooting each other with jokes and then claiming we are just kidding. And yet later as they talked things out, they better understood the damage it causes. Sometimes the person was actually just kidding. However, the spouse on the receiving end didn't view their humor in the same way. Humor is as it is perceived and received. Other times, certain humor isn't appropriate because of a passive, aggressive thing going on. Whatever the reason, we have had to work through these issues through the years because a lot of damage can be done to the relationship when one aims their humor at the other and it isn't received as being a joking matter. Proverbs 26 verse 18 to 19 from the Message Bible says, People who shrug off deliberate deception saying, I didn't mean it, I was only joking, are worse than careless campers who walk away from smoldering campfires. Well, we have all experienced the truth of these words all too many times. Author Rodney A. Wilson talks about sarcastic humor that damages in a Home Life magazine article titled Cut the Sarcasm. In it he writes, My dictionary is ancient, but its definition of sarcasm is classic. Sarcasm comes from a word meaning to tear flesh like dogs. It means to be brutal, have no mercy, be vicious, go for the juggler, and tear flesh the way a dog would. Well, that doesn't sound to us like something we should be doing to each other as husbands and wives who love God and pledge to love and honor each other. To truly love our spouse is to protect them by showing honor and respect for their feelings, not revealing or doing anything that will embarrass or cut them down. By doing so, we reveal just how mean-spirited and unsafe we can be, which is not becoming of a child of God. In the magazine article which we have referred to previously, Mr. Wilson continues to write, While humor may appear to soften the blow, the unseen emotional damage of sarcasm can be devastating. I am convinced many marriages die of a thousand emotional cuts instead of one deadly blow. A steady diet of sarcasm poisons a marriage, so it needs to be eliminated. No good comes from using sarcasm. Trust, a vital ingredient in a healthy marriage, won't be present when a husband or wife is always braced for the next public or private cutting remark from a spouse. And respect won't be found in the midst of ridicule. A sarcastic environment robs a marriage of peace and joy, which are two parts of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life, recorded in Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. In essence, sarcasm severely limits the intimacy between a husband and a wife. There are plenty of healthy ways to fit humor into your marriage. Choose to break the sarcasm habit and die daily to yourselves. Well, that one you can see First Corinthians 15 verse 31. In another article titled Sarcasm, the verbal enemy at the gate, featured on the Lifeway website, authors Dale and Jenna Forhard also speak about sarcasm and humor that hurts. They write, Sarcasm is one of the most harmful verbal tactic used against a spouse. It destroys communication and unity in marriage. One of the oldest military strategies is to divide and conquer. Our enemy Satan still uses that tactic to destroy families. Satan first seeks to separate you and your spouse emotionally. Then he moves in and seeks to separate you and your spouse physically. When this occurs, he is in a perfect position to conquer your marriage. In the midst of conflict, the enemy begins outside the gate of your marriage, cunningly tempting you and your spouse to wage war through verbal attacks. And sarcasm often is Satan's weapon of choice. 
The authors then give an acrostic to help you to understand why sarcastic remarks are so damaging to marriages. Sarcasm stings, it aggravates, it retaliates, it is controlling, it alienates, it shames, and it manipulates. Near the end of the article, the authors challenge us to lay it down. They write what will conclude this message with something we should never forget. They say, if we know the enemy uses sarcasm to tear down marriages, then what can we do about it? We need to lay down the weapons of our enemies and pick up the weapons God has given us through his word. Colossians 3 verse 12 to 17 provides the perfect answer. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of God dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Our prayer is that God will Make your marriage a marriage that is full of love, abundant love. Thank you for keeping it Adventist World Radio the voice of hope. We'll be glad to receive your views, comments, and suggestions. Send them to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. We are also online at awrnairobi at eau.adventist.org. <laughs> tuned into Adventist World Radio, The Voice of Hope, and I am your presenter, Tilen Odiambo. Let us now listen to Pastor Kigundu Ndwiga as he tells us what money should do. Stay tuned so that you can learn if there is any difference from your view on what money should do.
dear listener, I want to welcome you to our Biblical Stewardship Series. We continue talking about money, and uh, I want us to answer this question, what does my money do? What does my money do? And I want us to go to the Bible where we read from First John 3 verse 16 and 17. The Bible says this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. 17. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? You see, our world encourages us to spend, spend, spend. We are bombarded by commercials that try to convince us that we are unloved, unpopular, or weird, and that we need a certain product to fix the situation. We are encouraged to charge, to borrow, and to purchase on delayed payment plans. We are tempted to fall for buying schemes that companies come up with to enable us to buy things now. The result? Personal debts are at an all-time high. Bankruptcies are rampant and financial worries are entering even the church. Christians today have gotten themselves into such a financial mess. The Bible talks about the church and our responsibility to help one another. Biblical principles dictate how God wants us to handle our finances, and that is what I want us to look at today. Now, money provides for necessities. Talking about how we need to handle our finances. First Timothy 5 verse 8, the Bible says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Therefore God expects a Christian to labor to provide for his family. Providing for necessities is part of keeping the faith. Give us today our daily bread. Matthew 6 verse 11. We need to recognize that God provides our daily necessities and labor to make sure our family's daily needs are met. More importantly, we need to know the difference between needs of the day and the desires of the heart. The difference between needs of the day and the desires of the heart. Many young people starting out on their own today look at how their parents labored for years to accumulate the little money they have. So wanting to be better off than their parents, wanting to have it all now, they begin adult life, charging, borrowing, and getting into debt beyond their ability to earn. We need, I repeat, we need to recognize the difference between needs and wants, between necessities and luxuries. And we need to remember the principle, I don't get it if I can't afford it. Let me repeat that one. I don't get it if I cannot afford it. But number two, money should be used to help others. So money helps others. When you read Ephesians 4 verse 28, the Bible says, He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Therefore, God expects us, his children, to be selfless about possessions. When we don't repay our debts, it is the same as stealing in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible teaches us that not paying your debts is the sin. First John 3, verse 16 to 17 says, And this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? So how you share, my dear friend, reveals your character. You can't claim God's love when you do not share with others. There was a man who went about helping others. One day he lost his job and was faced with a shortage of money. In order to continue helping others, he began robbing banks. Most of the money he stole, he used to help others. So now, question comes, is God pleased with such Robin Hood acts of robbing from the rich to give to the poor? How we get the money must be 
as pleasing to God, listen, as what you do with the money. So how you get the money is important just as what you do with the money. And therefore, when it comes to dealing with money, honesty must be your guide. When you read Romans 13, verse 7 to 8, this is what the Bible says, Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. The heading concludes and says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. So, pay what you owe, owe no man anything. This, of course, does not mean that you are not to borrow at all or never use credit or never have a mortgage on your house. This means you must pay your bills on time and never buy or make a commitment to something you cannot afford. The Bible in uh, James 5 verse 12 says, Let your yes be yes and your no be no or you will be condemned. In other words, say what you mean and mean what you say. If you commit to paying a bill and don't pay, you have lied. In other words, if I do not have the money to pay my bills, but I have the money to purchase luxury items, to take my wife out to dinner, to spurge I am stealing from others for my own pleasure and I am lying to others. So when Christians deliberately lie to their creditors about their plans to repay them, when they deliberately buy unnecessary things they cannot afford, they bring shame upon themselves, the church and God, and they are lying and stealing. And let me ask you, what kind of image do you project of yourself and the church by the way you deal with your creditors? And that's why we are saying, give God what belongs to God. Because when you read Mark 12 verse 17, Jesus said, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Therefore we are to render to the government what we owe them and we are to render to God the things that we owe God. When you read 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2 says, On the first day of, the, of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. God has commanded that we give back to God as we have prospered. Some of us have quit paying God what we owe him. What does God say about this? Well, you can read that one in Malachi 3 verse 7 to 12. We rob God when we cease contributing as we should. And, my dear listener, my dear friend, please be content with what you can afford. Luke 3 verse 14 says, Don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. We must be content with what we earn. If we cannot afford something, we ought to be able to do without it. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. We are not to be covetous, desiring things we cannot afford. Instead, we must be content with what God has provided us. And Paul says this in 1 Timothy 6 verse 8. If we have food and clothing, will we be content with that? So, do you have enough to eat? Do you have a place to live? Do you have clothes to wear? These are the necessities. We should not purchase more things unless we can afford them. The parting shot, the conclusion, I want to share or to challenge you to remember these. I want to share with you or to challenge you to remember these principles. Number one, we must work to provide the necessities of our families. Number two, a lazy person who does not work is worse than the one who does not believe in God. Number three, we should be satisfied with our daily necessities. Number four, our work must help others. Number five, our giving must reflect our compassion. Number six, we should not resort to stealing to pay our bills. Number seven, all our dealings must be honest. Number eight, a delayed or missed payment is equivalent to lying and stealing. The other principle is set aside God's tithe as soon as you get your paycheck. And remember, withholding tithe is the same as stealing from God. And don't forget, not returning tithe is an indication of an unbalanced spiritual life. 
and God demands the first fruits of our labors. And finally, remember, we are to be content with food, clothing, and a place to live. May God help us to use our money wisely. Hope that I have made your day wonderful. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our program today. Feel free to send us your views, comments, and suggestions by writing to the producer Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Our email address is awrnairobi at eau.adventist.org. I have been your host, Tilen Odiambo. Be blessed. Thank you.